Good morning, everybody. It's a warm welcome to our service today, and uh, it's a nice sunny day today, so a bit cold, but uh, it's good to see you all. And also that goes to uh, are those on uh, Facebook or YouTube or however you might be watching this service at a later date. Uh, today our service is uh, a similar service to normal. Uh, our Elder Andrew Ryden, Andrew Ryden, Andrew Proudfoot will be uh, preaching. Uh, <laughs> yes, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Andrew Proudfoot definitely <laughs> will be preaching in 1 Corinthians. Uh, before that, of course, we've got our normal time of praise and worship and uh, uh, prayer. And uh, before that, we have our notices. So if we could have those, please, on the projected up. Uh, tonight, w tonight we have our uh, in-person prayer meeting up here at the chapel, which takes over from the uh, uh, Monday night uh, Zoom prayer.
prayer meeting. So if you're available at all, please come along and join with us uh, for prayer this evening. And Tuesday, the home group uh, on Zoom uh, is a prayer meeting. And on Wednesday, we have uh, the ladies' Bible study at uh, Mill, uh, 10, 10 o'clock at Mill Road, Royston. And the home group in the evening at 18 Towns and Close, Barkway. On the 9th of April, we have uh, next Saturday a Saturday special, 6 p.m. at 115 Melbourne Road, Royston. And the Marsdens would like to know how many people are likely to attend. So if you could put your hand up if you're intending to, to attend. Well, on the 10th of April, that's uh, a week today, we have an Easter card delivery. What we're planning to do is, is deliver cards to all the village, not only just to uh, uh, tell people about Easter, but also to remind them about our services and to invite them along. Uh, we need post people to come along and deliver these. So if you're available next Sunday after the service to deliver these cards, they'll We'll all be up here by then. Uh, then they'll be, we'll be most grateful if you can uh, help us with that. On the back, back of it, not that it's going to be. Uh, 15th of April, Good Friday service at 11 o'clock at the chapel. 2nd of May, Royston Mayfair, 12 noon to 4.30 in Priory Gardens. We hope to have uh, uh, something going on at that uh, uh, at that event, and on the 5th of June, it's the Queen's Jubilee, again, uh, we hope to have something going on there, but more information about that as we uh, come along. There are still some programmes uh, for uh, uh, the King's Park event that happened last week. Uh, at the back on the, of the coffee shop, if you lost yours or would like one, please do take one afterwards. Uh, is there any other notices that we need to say? Ben, have I missed them? Anything else? No? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> right, so I'll hand back now to the uh, band for a time of uh, praise. If you were with us on the weekend away, you will have um, heard about, yeah, how important it is for us to fight the battle. Um, we're going to sing a song, some of the songs we sang over the weekend. But I would encourage you, even if you weren't there, um, the email that went out has, has got links to the talks, which you could listen to, um, and some questions of reflection for all of us who were there, whether you were there or not, to, to think about putting into practice uh, what, uh, what we were hearing from, uh, from God's word, what Josh Fortune was, was sharing with us. So do, uh, do have a look through those, um, and uh, do, do, uh, if you didn't get that email, do speak to, uh, to Andrew, and we'll make sure that you, you do get that so you can have a chance to catch up um, and to listen. So let's stand, we're gonna sing um, The Battle Belongs.
Yes, Lord Jesus, we want you to be the centre of our lives. We want you to be the rock on which we stand. We want you to be the light and the guide. Lord, I pray that uh, we will allow you to take your rightful place in our lives. And uh, if we do, Lord, we know your promise is there, that you will hold us fast. You will never leave us or forsake us. Oh 
I waited for the Lord. He turned to me. He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Father God, you have saved us. Lord, those who are in you, those who have called on the Lord Jesus, you've lifted us, uh, us out of that pit. That pit, Lord, we were there because of our sin, because of our rebellion against you. And uh, we couldn't save ourselves, but you are the Lord who lifted us out of that. And uh, you put us on a firm rock, uh, a, a solid place. And you put a new song in our mouth, Lord. We just thank you for the salvation that you brought for us in the Lord Jesus. I will proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and faithfulness from the great assembly. Lord, your, we do not conceal, Lord, what you've done for us. Lord, we can't hold it in. I just pray that as we, as we sing your praises together, as we worship uh, around your word, as we're going to be hearing, as we uh, spend time talking with each other and as, uh, during the week, Lord, as we, as we um, yeah, have opportunities to, uh, to share with others, we just pray that we will not conceal what you've done for us in our hearts, what the, the wonderful things that you've done, the way you've saved us. Give us, Lord, that confidence and that joy. To, uh, to share that, Lord, with others. Lord, we just thank you for this service. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity we've got to meet together. We thank you for King's Park last weekend. Lord, thank you that so many were able to come and the way you spoke to us, the way you challenged us, the way you, you showed us, Lord, what it is to, to, uh, to be in the fight as a Christian. Um, and there are so many practical things we took away from that weekend. And yet, Lord, we're so prone to forget. We're so prone just to move on. Uh, to, so prone to just getting back into our normal routines again. And um, Lord, somehow these birds come and take away the seed that has been uh, sown. We just pray that that wouldn't happen for us. Help us, Lord, to put into practice. Lord, particularly those things that we were challenged to do regarding temptation and areas of weakness. To, uh, yeah, to have and learn the scriptures relevant to those so that we can be ready, um, that we can be armed, that we can put on the full armor of God um, and uh, we can stand and fight in your strength and in your strength alone because the battle is yours. I pray that you will help us to do that. I pray for Andrew as he's going to be bringing your word to us this morning, a challenging word, a challenging passage, Lord, that will... Yeah, speak to us as how we interact as a community, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we'd be ready to hear from you. And I pray that you'd, you'd help him as he shares what he's prepared, Lord. And I pray, that again, that uh, we'll put that into practice. That we'll be, we'll be obedient 
servants who, uh, who are ready to hear from our master and ready to be challenged and ready to obey. Father, uh, our hearts are full with what we see in the news with the awful suffering and death that's happening in Ukraine. Lord, we feel so powerless in the face of such, uh, such warfare and such barbarism. I just pray, Lord, that you'll have mercy. Have mercy on those who are clinging on, those who are trapped, those who are, f are fleeing, those who, whose lives are in danger. I just pray that you will hear their cry, that you'll have mercy on them, that you'll bring this war to an end, that there will be peace in that land. There will be justice, Lord, for these atrocities which have been done. Lord, you are an almighty, almighty God. Uh, Lord, you, you hear the cry of the, the powerless um, and uh, you fight for them. And I pray that you would do that in Ukraine, Lord. And uh, yeah, many people around the world are struggling <laughs> in different ways. Lord, we've, we've seen a huge rise in the cost of living here with fuel bills going up this week. And that's mirrored around the world with food prices rocketing and those who are poor here and overseas are really struggling to make ends meet. Lord, have mercy. I pray that you will provide for those who are in need. I pray you'd show us who have, how we can be generous, how we can help, how we can help others here in this land, how we can help others in other parts of the world, Lord. We just pray that you'll have mercy and that you'll hear the cries of all who, who are suffering. And Lord, as a church, uh, I just want to pray that you'll guide us to the right pastor. Lord, we thank you for Paul Dutton. We thank you for the, the way you've, uh, you've brought him um, uh, to, to know us and us to know him. Thank you that how him and Tanya and Seth and Ola were able to join us last weekend and how we had a chance to get to know him better. Please give us and give him wisdom as we come to this point of decision. Um, I, I pray, Lord, you'll make it very clear in, in your will that for us as a whole church and for him, whether he is the right person to lead us. Um, and uh, yeah, I pray that uh, we just have a sense that your hand is in this, even as we come together to pray this evening. Lord, I just pray that you will, uh, yeah, that you'll, you'll guide. There'll just be a sense that your Holy Spirit is leading us all as a church. We just thank you, Lord, for the way we can come to you with our prayers with all the things that are on our hearts in our own lives and that you hear, you answer our prayer and you care for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it's time for the uh, children to go to their activities. I don't know who's leading this week. It's Joe. Right, okay. Is there any children? <laughs> right. Okay, well, as that happens or not... I'll ask uh, Marie to come up and uh, read today's passage and then straight away Andrew Proudfoot will, will then speak to us. So. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs us up while love builds us up. Builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol has n is nothing at all in this world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still ac so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since they're conscience is weak it is defiled but food does not bring us near to God we are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do be careful however that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak for if someone is weak with a weak 
with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. And uh, welcome as well from me uh, to all who are here and all who are joining online. Uh, if one Andrew Ryden is uh, joining online, maybe that's a call to the pastorate. Uh, so have a, have a consider your ministry, Andrew. <laughs> right. So uh, we're looking uh, today. We're continuing our series in Corinthians, uh, and we're in chapter eight. This is yes. Okay. So, Paul says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Now, if you're the caring type, then these verses confirm everything that you feel. The heart is more important than the head. Emotions are more important than the intellect. And we are called as Christians to share the experience of loving and being loved and not to study dry theology and to build up our head knowledge. If, on the other hand, you're of a more bothy disposition, like what I am, uh, you will suspect that there is something more going on here than a simple prioritization of heart over head. After all, elsewhere, Paul praises the depth of the riches of the wonders of the knowledge of God. And seeing his and our, and our ministry as being to spread the aroma of the knowledge of God. And our goal being uh, to be united in the knowledge of the Son of God. He prays that the church will be filled with knowledge of God's will. And of course, one of the gifts of the Spirit, which he goes on to, to speak of in 1 Corinthians, which is given to build up the church, is a message of knowledge. So we boffs might also point out that another word for caring is to be thoughtful, which implies using what's between your ears, using the knowledge that you have to help someone else. Otherwise, your love couldn't be put to good use. Unless you know God's ways, how can you walk in them and help others to do likewise? In truth, there should be no competition between knowledge and love. We can know God's love, and we can love to know God's word. So what is going on here for Paul to open this section on food sacrifice to idols with a cartoon contrast between knowledge and love? Knowledge puffs up, Paul says, like one of those puff breads you get at number 42, the restaurant down in Royston. If you've ever eaten there, that bread quickly swells up to massive proportions with hot air, but just as quickly collapses back to a flat bread that you can dip into your humus. Knowledge is somehow like that, making you seem much more substantial than you are, but not able to satisfy in the same way that a loaf of normal bread of the same size would. But love, on the other hand, Builds up. Building is a much more slow process. If we switch metaphors to houses, it takes time to lay foundations and then each course of bricks and so on until the roof is put on and the house is complete. But what you end up with is a solid structure able to withstand the wind and the rain. Not like a bouncy castle, which being inflated in just a couple of minutes is the building equivalent of a puff bread. What is important is real, sustainable growth and maturity, whether it be a finished house to live in or a more slow-rising, substantial loaf of bread to share. 
Now, for Paul to need to use such a striking metaphor suggests that there was something fundamentally wrong with the Corinthian church, which was the root of their disagreements over meat. Just like we saw a few weeks ago in the, with that case, case of incest, while the presenting symptom might be specific to their case and seem rather irrelevant to us, incest in chapter 5 and meat sacrifice to idols here, the underlying cause of those problems could well affect us today too. I'll get into that a little later, but first we need to learn a little more about what the issue with meat was. Now, in the 21st century, meat is in plentiful supply. Almost every family could, if they wanted to, eat meat every day or even at every meal. With tremendous advances in our understanding of animal growth and an industrial approach to meat production, as this photo shows, meat is in more plentiful supply than it has ever been in the whole of history. Our battle today with meat is arguably drawn on two fronts. The battle that Joshua loves to fight, to resist the campaigns of the vegetarian and vegan lobby by promoting the pleasures and the benefits of meat consumption, and the battle that many of the rest of us like to fight, uh, which is to balance those pleasures and benefits against the conditions which our meat is produced in. And although I find this argument uh, rather overplayed, the environmental impact of growing meat, not vegetables. You see, coming from a Scottish island where sheep outnumber people by about 10 to 1 and are, are grazed on land like this, which couldn't produce much in the way of vegetables anyway, that might explain my view on that latter point. However, the issues in the first century were far different to ours. Meat production was on a much lower scale and a very large percentage of the population could not afford to eat meat with any regularity. There were a few qualms about the treatment of animals, partly because intensive farming hadn't been invented yet, and partly because there were few qualms about the treatment of humans either. The majority survived on a vegetarian diet, not out of principle, but out of necessity. <coughs> What meat there was in cities like Corinth would come from animals which had been sacrificed to one of the many gods of the Greek pantheon. It was common practice for the meat to be burnt in the sacrifice, for part of the meat to be burnt in sacrifice, part of it to be kept by the priests for their own use with the temple staff, and part would be sold to the markets. Uh, so they'd be sold down in the town with no labels on it as to where it had come from or, of course, what the sell-by date was. I guess the nose was the best judge of that in those days. For the vast majority of people, their opportunity to eat, to eat meat came from either occasionally buying such meat at the market or by going to a meal in one of the temples. The rich, however, and there were rich people in the Corinthian church as well as in the city, could afford to buy meat from other sources or host meaty meals at their own, own home or even at the temple. Temples were everywhere in Corinth since there were so many gods to choose from. In fact, people didn't need to choose at all. They could give their allegiance to as many different gods as they wished. And here's an example of uh, a typical temple uh, actually in Corinth. And you can see it's actually, is this, yeah, there we go. So the thing's just about working. As you can see, it's on two levels here. There's an upper level. Uh, yeah, we need to get better batteries for these things. There's an upper level uh, and then a lower level. Uh, and there's a little plan to help us. Some, somebody's done this little plan of uh, how, the, uh, how the temple looked. So on the left, uh, this is actually looking at it the other way around, unfortunately. So on the left, you've got the upper part. On the right, you've got the lower part. And in the upper part, that's kind of the inner courtyard of the temple where the sacrifices happened uh, and the, the worship per se uh, 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 carried on. And then in the right, you've got an outer courtyard where people would mix, there'd be a few stalls and so on. And on the kind of adjoining corridor, uh, which yeah, it's not going to show, on the adjoining corridor, uh, there were about three or four 
dining rooms. And these were dining rooms that uh, you could hire. Much like uh, today, if you wanted to go out for a birthday meal and you would uh, you'd arrange to, to, to have a table at a restaurant, so you could arrange to have uh, one of those rooms uh, in the temple uh, to hire for your special event. Although generally in those days, those special events would be religious uh, occasions like new moons rather than individualistic things like uh, birthday parties, which I don't think were such a big thing back then. But the point is that rather than going to restaurants with friends as we do today, in the first century, <clears throat> in Corinth, people would go to a temple. They could then cook some meat, which early in the day had been sacrificed in that inner temple, and eat it along with the rest of their meal, reclining leisurely at the table, as was their wont, and in full view of people in the courtyard or even walking past. Since the roof was there to protect them from the sun rather than from the wind and the rain, and there was no need to have walls for that purpose because, of course, in Corinth, the climate is much warmer than here. Now, while the Corinthian believers uh, who were converts from Judaism would have no truck at all with these temples, they were forbidden from eating there as Jews, and, of course, forbidden from worshipping other gods, the converts from paganism would be used to that whole system and to all the socializing that went on within it. And that raised a number of questions with which the early church in general had to grapple with. Firstly, should they buy meat from the market, knowing that it had probably, but not definitely, come from a sacrifice at a pagan temple? Should they accept an invitation from a non-Christian friend to come round their house for dinner where meat might be served that also might have been sacrificed in a temple? Or should they share a meal with friends in a temple dining room, knowing for sure that the meat had been sacrificed to that false god? Now, these questions are more nuanced than the easy to answer. Should they offer a sacrifice to a pagan god which clearly for both Jews and for non-Jewish Christians uh, were, was definitely not on. They and we are to serve and honor the one true God only. Now what we have in 1 Corinthians 8 is one window into the discussion which raged in the, in the first century and indeed for some time after. And it's important to put that into context. The first time the issue was discussed was back in Acts 15 at the very first church council in Jerusalem around AD 48. And the main issue under discussion was actually circumcision, raised by some Jewish believers who wanted to force the practice on the new Gentile converts out there too. But as a sideline, the council, which included Paul as well as Peter, gave a ruling that the new requirements for Christians were not to follow the whole law of the Old Testament, but instead to abstain from food polluted by idols, as well as sexual immorality and from the meat of strangled animals and blood. Now that might seem to end the matter. The whole church had gathered, they'd made the ruling, and that was that. But as the Gentile church grew, and churches were established across the Roman world, the problem needed to be rethought. You see, it was fine for Christians in Israel to avoid food polluted by idols, since there was a supply of kosher meat and there weren't too many pagan temples in Israel. But in cities like Corinth, as I said, that was not the case. The initial ban, which was really a peripheral part of the decision not to force the Gentiles to follow all the Jewish rules, particularly circumcision, now that ban had an effect of condemning the church outside of Israel to vegetarianism, which, whatever your views in the 21st century, was not at all what was intended in the first. So the next window we get into this debate is about seven years later, here in this passage in 1 Corinthians, which was written around AD 55, we think. Now remember that this letter is Paul's response to an earlier one from the Corinthians, which is why a lot of what he says is in quotes in the most recent uh, uh, version of the NIV at least, relating back to points which he, they had raised, including what to do about eating meat. 
Our passage today isn't the whole story of what Paul says to the Corinthians. It's the first of two chapters which look at this, where Paul develops his argument in response to the Corinthians. So just an outline here. In chapter 8 here, Paul describes their position and points out that they're coming at it from entirely the wrong angle. Rather than looking to exert their rights, they should be looking to protect and truly build up the whole church. In chapter 9, which a certain Paul Dutton will be preaching on in a few weeks' time, uh, he takes a, a digression to show how he, the Apostle Paul, has given up his rights as an apostle and how we should also limit our freedoms living a disciplined life for the sake of others. And in chapter 10, which Phil, I think, will cover in a few weeks' time, uh, Paul returns to the topic to warn them of the dangers of association, of association with idol worship and how to use their freedom for God's glory and not for puffing themselves up and for their own glory. <clears throat> now, a couple of years later, Paul returns to the issue when he's writing to the Romans in Romans 14 and 15. And there he is at pains to stress the need to prioritize the unity of the church over a uniformity of what we find to be acceptable, either in what we eat or drink or in any other area of life. As in Corinthians, he wants to protect the faith of the weak, urging those who think themselves strong not to damage the vulnerable by their actions. And also urging the weak not to expect or ask the strong to abide by the stricter rules which they prefer. <clears throat> now the key to all of this is that the church should be united in glorifying God. Appetites for meat or for anything else should be set aside for that reason. And the church should be a model for living in unity even when there's disagreement about peripheral issues. So with that background in place, it seems that what was going on was this. The supposedly knowledgeable and strong Corinthians were encouraging the weaker ones to join them in taking part in meals in pagan temples, expecting that this would build the weaker ones up to their level. Their thinking was that since there is only one true God, and since idols and false gods don't exist and their temples therefore are just buildings... Uh, <clears throat> and also, as Jesus said, it isn't what goes into the body, uh, food, which makes us clean or unclean, uh, so it doesn't matter what we eat. When you add all those things together, the conclusion was that they could eat meat that had been sacrificed to a false god in a temple, because that false god doesn't exist, the temple is just a building, and they could do all of this with impunity. Now you can see their argument. And if that was all there was to it, then they were perfectly entitled to eat in temple dining rooms and to encourage everyone to follow in their libertarian ways. But unfortunately, there is more to it than that, both on the issue of idols and on the principle we should use in the church to handle our differences of opinion. Paul starts to unpick their arguments in verses 4 to 6. Quoting back to them two of their key points. An idol is nothing at all in the world, and there is no God but one. Both of these are true statements, especially the second, which is the fundamental Jewish creed, which was carried forward into Christianity and marks both out as what we call monotheist, monotheistic faiths. That is, we believe in just one God. It's not just that we only worship one God and refuse to worship others. It's that there is only one God. There is no Zeus or Aphrodite, no Baal or any other deity which the pagans worship. They do not exist. And so the first point follows from the second, which actually makes us wonder why Paul put it in that order. Maybe they did too, and that was part of the error of the Corinthians. But Paul doesn't leave it there. In verse 5, he seems to admit that there are many gods and lords. 
What is he getting at? And I think it's that although there are no real gods apart from Yahweh, we can't ignore the fact that many people in the world worship other gods and lords. They may not exist as such, but in the minds of the worshippers, they do. And to worship them breaks the first and second commandments. And almost in passing, Paul pens one of the most crucial verses in, in, in uh, Christian theology in verse 6. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come and through whom we live. This is important because in one breath it speaks of God the Father and Christ the Lord in a context where God and Lord are being used synonymously. They mean the same thing. The technical difference between those two words was that God was used to describe the classic pantheon of the Greeks, including Zeus and, Zeus and Athena and so on, while Lord was used to describe the more mystical gods of the Gnostics. And so Paul was extending that classic Jewish creed, there is no God but one, with God is the Father and Jesus Christ is God. Now, in truth, he didn't spell it out uh, uh, spell out now what, what the Orthodox Trinitarian position is very clearly, which leads, led some to believe that there's a hierarchy here between the Father as kind of top God and Christ as secondary lesser divinity Lord. But other verses counter this, of course, like in Colossians 1, where Paul writes that the fullness of God lives in Christ in bodily form. He also, you'll have noticed, omits the Holy Spirit which rather embarrassingly led someone in the 4th century to add an extra statement there to correct what Paul had said, uh, to say that, and the one Holy Spirit in whom all things live, and we in him. That addition has been removed. And of course, we know that there are other cases uh, where Paul uh, and the rest of the New Testament supports the position of the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity, such as the grace with which we will end the service, which comes from the end of one of Paul's letters, in fact, his next letter, 2 Corinthians. Anyway, it's another sermon to look at uh, how Trinitarian theology developed. Uh, and the, po the important point here is that in their arrogance, the supposedly strong Corinthians had overlooked that idols were a snare to many people. Yes, they might not exist, but they are still a snare. There were some new Christians for whom it would be dangerous to go back to pagan temples and eat there because their immature minds, in their immature minds, they still thought that those gods were real. And even if they had committed not to serve them. So Paul has to correct the strong ones, which he does in verses 7 uh, through 11. There we go. So some people, he says, are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. If someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? And so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Very strong words. Not everyone has the knowledge they claim that every Christian does. And that meant that far from helping their weaker brothers and sisters to build up their faith in God, taking them to temple dining rooms would embolden them, which is the same word in Greek as to build up, not to, in their faith in God, but in their minds to take part in idol worship. And no one wanted that. So it must be avoided at all costs since that could destroy them. It would be a sin against Christ as it would be harming part of his body, which is the church. Now some think that Paul, when Paul says the weak will be destroyed, he really means that they will be eternally damned. But that goes against the assurance of salvation which Christ gives us. I and other what I would call good commentators 
I think it means to be destroyed in this life, still a dangerous thing, still an unfortunate thing, in that their walk with Christ will be compromised by them walking also with idols. And Paul goes on in chapter 10 to say that although the gods themselves do not exist, behind them our enemy that we heard it about at King's Park is at work, seeking as ever to keep people away from God and to give God's glory somewhere else. And hence, we must have nothing to do with idolatry or pagan temples. I'll leave that to Phil to expand. You see, the root of their problem was that they were putting their knowledge before their love. They were arrogantly thinking that they were the mature ones with strong faith, able to handle the presence of idols because they knew there was only one God. And actually, this arrogant attitude was quite common in Corinth and in Greek culture of the time. And the idea that the more mature were party to some secret knowledge or gnosis that enabled them to see things as they really were and then to lead libertarian lives as a result, that was rife. Again, I want to emphasize that the problem was not knowledge as such, nor even the specific knowledge that they had, although Paul has more to say about idols in chapter 10, their problem was that they used their knowledge to puff themselves up without really thinking of the consequences for those around them. They were thinking of themselves, not of others. And that's where love needs to take the priority. If only they looked with love on their weaker brothers and sisters rather than with arrogance, their role as a stronger was not to cajole the weak to follow their example, but to get alongside them where they were, to understand where they were coming from, and so to help to build them up in their faith. That's such an important task that it's worth giving up our own rights to do. And Paul even goes as far to say in verse 13 that he would never eat meat again if it would prevent a brother or sister from falling away. He makes a strong point here in verse 8 that food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Notice that he starts with the position of not eating. He says to the strong that the weak are in no way disadvantaged or weaker because they don't eat meat. And the converse, the strong are in no better a position because they do. What Paul is asking them to give up is not something that is worth anything anyway. It would not disadvantage them in any way to give up eating meat entirely. And it might help others not to fall into sin. And that sounds like a good deal to me. It's the loving thing to do, but it also stands to reason. It's consistent with applying true knowledge in the right way. And that's what I meant at the beginning when I said that there shouldn't be a competition between knowledge and love. Both have their roles to play in the Christian life. But as Paul goes on to say in the famous chapter 13, while knowledge will pass away, love will remain. So what can we learn some 2,000 years later from this first century controversy about how we should handle our differences? For all the differences in culture and lifestyles, the heart of the issues are remarkably similar, even if the things we disagree about are quite different. <clears throat> the first thing to say is that there will always be strong and weak within the church. We are not going to agree in every detail of the Christian life. The strong have sufficient confidence in their position before God to handle situations that might make the weak doubt and waver. In Corinth, they were so convinced of the non-existence of idols and false gods that they could eat in temples without that affecting their conscience. They did not think they were do what they were doing was wrong, and it did not affect their devotion to God. They were not putting the idol in any way before Him. In our day, Maybe the strong are those who can go to pubs or clubs without compromising their walk with God, whereas the weak, particularly if they're from a background of alcohol abuse, 
and would be led astray and are far better off avoiding those places in case they get drunk and go on to do things they will later regret. Or a more recent example may be the strong are those who understand the nature of modern biotechnology and how some of the cell lines that are used in some of the development and research were taken from aborted babies many decades ago. And they're comfortable with accepting the vaccines and therapies which do not rely on any such morally dubious materials today. Whereas the weak would be going against their conscience to be vaccinated with something that had benefited in any way at all from an abortion, however far in the past that might have been. Probably you can come up with your own weak and strong examples here. It doesn't especially matter. The point is, how do the weak and the strong relate to each other. Now the strong must avoid the mistake which the Corinthians made, which is to think themselves superior to the weak. To see their role as building up the weak, to be more like them, with the prime driver to stand up for their rights and to live strongly. Rather than thinking of themselves and how strong they were, they should think about the weak and how their words and deeds will affect the weak, trying to see how the world looks from their weaker perspective. And the strong must recognize that they have a responsibility for the weak, not to make them more like themselves, but to prevent the weak from falling, to protect and nurture them so they will grow in confidence in the Lord and in love for Him. In short, they must love the weak so much that they are prepared to give up their own rights and their own reputations to protect them. Now this might seem to turn the weak and the strong upside down. So rather than, ha rather than having our church practices defined by those with stronger faith, they are dictated by the weakest. And in a sense, that's true. Christianity does have a habit of turning the world upside down. But it's not as simple as that, of course. Just as the strong have a duty to love the weak and to accept that they have a different perspective, so the weak have a duty to love the strong and to accept that the strong see things differently. While the strong mustn't flaunt their freedoms in front of the weak, the weak must not demand that the strong live in the more narrow and restrictive way that they feel comfortable with. Now, the way of the world is to reject the possibility of those two camps from having fellowship with one another. As we see in the increasing polar polarization of politics and society in the US and the UK over issues like Donald Trump for our American cousins and the ongoing divisions over the outfall of Brexit here. Social media herds us into those factions which reinforce our, their own opinions and the vilification of those who take a different view. And if we are not careful, we will take those attitudes into the church too. You see, it's inevitable that people will see things differently. But it's not inevitable that people who see things differently will be at each other's throats. The church is to model another way, a better way, which is enabled by the power and by the grace of God. A way which Paul calls the most excellent way at the end of chapter 12 and in his introduction to chapter 13. And that is, of course, the way of love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have shown us the way of love. That you, of all people, have shown us what it is to give up your rights for those who are weaker. When you took the form of mankind, you became a human to live and then to die, to subject yourself to all the fragility of life and to all the pain of death on our behalf. We thank you for that example of love that you gave. And we thank you for that power 
that your death and resurrection provides to us that we might also live more like you. So help us each one as we go through our lives to look to see what we can do to build one another up, not to build or to puff ourselves up, but to build others up in the knowledge and in the love of God. We do thank you for all the opportunities that we have for this, for the fellowship on a Sunday, for the weekend that we've had away, and for all other opportunities that we get. We pray that we would take those and that we would be able to encourage and help one another, even where we have differences in opinions and things that might seem important. On those vital things, we are united. We are united in love for you. Amen. Stand and sing our final song for the sake of the world. I'm laying down my life, I'm giving up control, I'm never looking back, I surrender all, I'm living for your glory. Passion in my heart, mystery in my soul. See the nations bow, well, the world to know. I'm living for your glory. Oh. For the sake of the well, but like a fire in me.
that's the uh, end of our service now. I've just got a notice to give, which I've just been passed, that there's no, actually, no little blessings for the next three Mondays. No, no little blessings for the next three Mondays. Shall we now close our service by saying the words of the grace to each other? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Right. Cheerio.